Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Monday, January 22nd, 2024. In a moment, Alistair Crook will address what is Netanyahu's goal? Is it to defeat Hamas or to get the hostages returned? And can he possibly do both? But first this. Judge Napolitano here. Do you know that we the people have reached 34 trillion plus in debt? It's unsustainable and it's growing. Our government is addicted to printing money and it's not gonna stop. And if you believe that as I do, then you need to understand why gold prices will continue to rise along with our staggering debt. In this report called $3,200 Gold, it explains how rising debt will cause the value of gold to rise and it could reach $3,200 an ounce. Listen to some of the stats that I pulled from this report. They make a very strong case for the likely surge in the value of gold. In 2002, gold was $256 an ounce and the national debt was $6.5 trillion. Last year, the debt broke through $33 trillion and gold exceeded $2,000 an ounce. That is a 400% rise in the debt and a 700% staggering rise in the value of gold. And now the debt has hit 34 trillion and the value of gold continues to rise along with it. It's great information from my friends at Lear Capital and I encourage every one of you to call today and get your copy of this report. There's no obligation to purchase. It's a free report. It's free education. Call 800-511-4620 or go to learjudgenap.com. And when you talk to my friends at Lear, tell them the judge sent you. Alistair, welcome here, uh, my dear friends. Is Israel a democracy? Does it believe in equal rights for all? Or is it a theocracy? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> it's neither. It's a special case. And it's always been a special case. Zionism because it is open to all Jews living anywhere in the world to return to the land of Israel, uh, Zionism was always predicated that for that there must be land and electricity and services that are available to anyone coming in and living and coming to Israel. And that therefore for that there must be special rights special administrative, special land, special rights and control over the land, water resources, all those things, and that therefore others cannot have the same rights. So it is essentially, um, it sounds almost a paradox, but an, it, it, <coughs> it is basically exclusionary inclusion. Exclusionary in that the Palestinians are out of it, but they are included in it. And this is really the fatal flaw. And this is what all of the problem is about at the moment. This flaw in the Zionist system by which they need and insist on special rights for Jews over territory which enjoys the is inhabited by a substantial proportion of non-Jews, by Palestinians, who won't enjoy those same rights. So it is essentially different. It is a democracy for those that have special rights and not for those who have none. So if you define a democracy as equal rights for all, it's not a democracy in that traditional definition. I mean, suppose I, as a Roman Catholic, bought a home in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem. Would I have the same rights as my Jewish neighbors? Not according to law, and also because it's intended to have different layers. So, I mean, it depends where you live, but if you live in the green zone, it's different from if you're living in, we call it the occupied territories, the West Bank or Gaza, they are very different rights. So there are different geographical rights. In the West Bank, uh, Palestinians have to use different roads from those that are used by Jews and settlers in the West Bank, uh, different administrative rights, where you can work, how you get work permit. Um, and different also security rights, because 
the, the Palestinians are subject to intervention by um, Israeli um, forces, armed forces at any time at the discretion of Israel. So they're kept in a chronic uncertainty. This is the second sort of paradox to the whole situation, or if you like, I would call it also a flaw in the Zionist system, is that in order to give uh, absolute security or order to try and give security um, to Jews living anywhere on the land of Israel, you had to create chronic insecurity and instability for non-Jews living in the same territory, i.e. the Palestinians. They live in deliberate insecurity as a part of a process to give Jews living in the territory uh, security. How about non-Jews that are not Palestinians, like my example of a Roman Catholic uh, moving to Jerusalem or Tel Aviv and purchasing land and expecting to have the same freedom and political rights as his Jewish neighbors. Is that unrealistic? Does that happen? Yes. No, it doesn't. You would, wouldn't have it. Uh, and furthermore, I mean, the, this, the aim is to have uh, Jewish law, halakha, eventually to be established over it. Uh, and you, you are excluded and you're excluded from certain aspects of life. Um, by not being Jewish. It is, uh, as it's made very clear by um, Israelis over the years, um, the, uh, the state of Israel is a Jewish state. That means and is a state for Jews uh, living there and who have special rights and special accommodation given to them because they're Jews. What is Netanyahu's uh, goal in the war? Is it the defeat of Hamas or is it the return of the hostages? Um, well, now it's neither. Um, I think the hostages are, you know, this is something that uh, uh, is important to a sector of Israeli public opinion very clearly and also to international opinion. Um, but as you will recall, um, a little while ago, there was um, an assassination in Beirut, in the Dahia part of Beirut, which is an open part. I mean, it's not sealed off or anything. I know it quite well. And he was assassinated uh, there, along with others in a block, an apartment block there. What perhaps is less well known uh, is that he was a negotiator on hostages. I think I've described before that actually, you know, the decision making is done in Gaza by the military wing, if you like. The Qassam brigades are in charge of the hostage negotiation, not those people sitting in Doha. They really, for some time now, uh, I mean, it's a separate, it's really a separate organization almost. They're not a, a, in charge of what is happening. In Gaza why, or in the military. Why would the Africa. Israelis? Why would the Israelis assassinate somebody with whom they were negotiating? Well, it's not the first time. I when I was doing a negotiation some time ago, a long time ago, in, in, in order to establish a ceasefire, um, and I had the agreement of uh, uh, Hamas from the Damascus um, the political council from Fatah. Uh, and um, I informed the Israelis that um, a, a ceasefire was about to begin the following day. And then I was woken up at four in the morning by um, Solana, who was the high representative. And he said, have you heard the news? And I said, no, what's happened? And he said, uh, listen. And I listened. And the Israelis had dropped a one-ton bomb on the house of Salah Shahada, who was the negotiator in this case on behalf of Hamas, killing him and 13 others, including all his family. So it's not the first time. I think it's a, a very clear signal that as far as Netanyahu is concerned, um, the hostages are not his first priority, shall we say, and what he's changed now. And he talks now, it's about a war um, from the river to the sea, from the river Jordan, anything west of the Jordan to the Mediterranean is now an open if you like land. Um, this is the result of the fact that the Zionist project, the project that I, uh, we've been talking, I was talking about at the outset, the special rights, was turned into an elaborate process, a very elaborate structure by which Palestinians could somehow be um, disappeared 
from the system. They had separate roads, separate areas in the West Bank, separateness in Gaza, separate rights, separate positions, and that they were left. This was something that um, Israel inherited from um, the 73 war uh, with Egypt, in which Sharon achieved great success by creating strong points uh, across the Sinai and leaving the Egyptian military to, in a sort of, to be immobilized at another level. And it worked very effectively there. And that was first transported to the West Bank by the settlers creating these high points, strong mm. points around the West Bank and leaving the other Palestinians, the Palestinians who were living in the West Bank in chronic uncertainty, no fixed borders, no geographic designation, no clear administrative or political or legal rights. Um, they were kept by the settlers, but not by them. And in this way, they hoped they could sort of manage this fundamental contradiction in um, Zionism of having one, if you like, sector of the population having special rights and special privileges in a territorial extension where there are other non-Jews who do not have those rights um, and who one day might, if there was a different political circumstances, demand the same rights, demand equal political rights, demand equal legal rights. And so this was a way of trying to sort of bypass this, um, I would call it a flaw in Zionism, because it just doesn't work. And this is why they've been saying um, for many years, I remember it from long ago when I first wrote about it. I mean, why they say a two-state solution is incompatible with Zionism. I mean, you have to say it, it is. It's not, it doesn't, it's not compatible with a system of, if you like, two-state rights, two-state system working together over the same territory. Here is a, a clip of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu using uh, the phrase from the river to the sea. Remember, if you use this phrase on many American college campuses and you have a Palestinian flag with you, you'll be removed from the campus. And a member of Congress, member of the House of Representatives, who is herself Palestinian, was reprimanded by the House of Representatives for using this same phrase. But here's Prime Minister Netanyahu using it as he sees fit. For 30 years... I am very consistent, and I'm saying something very simple. This conflict is not on the lack of a state of Palestinian, but the existence of a state, the Jewish state. Every area that we evacuate, we receive terrible terror against that. It happened in South Lebanon, in Gaza, and also Judea and Samaria, which we did it. And therefore, I clarify that in other arrangement, any other arrangement, in the future, the state of Israel has to control on the entire area from the river to the uh, sea. This is what happens when you have sovereignty. This truth I say to our American friends, and I also stopped the attempt to impose on us a reality that will jeopardize us. A prime minister in Israel has to be able to say no, even to the best of friends to say no when you need to and to say yes when you can. Of course, the reference to saying no to the best of friends is to uh, President Biden uh, and the United States. So I'm interested in this phrase, from the river to the sea. I'm also interested in a phrase you used earlier, and of course you've written about this and given me a heads up on it, about these indefinite uh, borders. Did Ariel Sharon come up with the idea that the Palestinians should not even know what their borders are. And did he ever say all of Israel, or believe as far as you know, Israel is from the river to the sea? Is In other words, is this novel uh, that uh, Israel and an Israeli prime minister is saying this out loud? Is this as a result of October 7? Or is this something they've always believed, always wanted, and now think they have an opportunity to achieve? Always wanted and always um, insisted on. Because a river to the sea, I mean, it depends who says it, but when uh, he says it, when the prime minister says it, what he's referring to is greater Israel. In other words, all the land 
um, uh, between the river and the sea, including going up to the Litani in some statements about what greater Israel is and going south into perhaps even the Sinai. Um, and he is indeed um, copying Sharon, who refused to demarcate space. He wanted to have fluid space militarily. It was a very unorthodox, very novel way of fighting where complete disrespect for political space, for military space, for legal space. He wanted to cross borders. He didn't want to fix any frontiers. Israel still doesn't have borders. It's still, I mean, they're still under negotiations. And they've always enjoyed that because it gave them more flexibility. And the point of it was, again, as we saw in, in, in Sinai in, in 73, it gave Israel the ability to create strong points, not to have to control the whole ground, but to immobilize the Egyptian army under a matrix of security points sitting above it. And this is what is being planned now, is to go back to Sharon's, um, Sharon's original concept, but to take, say, our security has no borders. It has no particular space. We're encompassing all of it, and we're going to create strong points above it, a matrix of overarching security. And under that, the Palestinians will be subject and will be uh, in, have the Israeli security enforced on it. And what that, where that will lead, I mean, will either lead, I suspect, either to greater Israel being established, um, the Zionist project being established across the whole territory of what they claim is greater Israel, or else it will be the collapse of the Zionist project and the abandonment of the Zionist project because it is no, more, it is no longer working. And this is why it's very important for, for the West to understand these basics, because simply calling for two-state solution uh, uh, you, as a palliative is really just nonsense. It's a fabulous sort of prospect, but it doesn't actually resolve anything. It is incompatible with Zionism, basically and fundamentally. And this was what was, you know, cooked up. Um, by uh, Sharon and then later Israelis, this sort of system by which there were two spaces on one land and one legal space and another legal space is at different level to bypass this whole problem. But then it blew up on the 7th of October when Hamas exploded out of Gaza and destroyed that sort of concept that they were being contained by this um, by this complex structure and also blew up the idea that it was possible to have security for Israel on one hand and massive insecurity for Palestinians on the other. Both these concepts were blown up and a two-state solution, which is all the European Union and others are talking about, including, including Washington. I mean, how are you going to, where is this two-state going to be? I mean, according to the law, 224, 338, the original uh, UN Security Council resolutions, it includes all the West Bank and Gaza. Well, what are you going to do about the, the West Bank? I've already said, you know, that it is people by nearly 800,000 settlers now who are armed and zealots and have absolutely no intention, whatever any government says of abandoning. These are fanatics. I've been to them. I've spoken to them. They are really radical people, even the Israeli army. And look at the Israeli army in the West Bank. It's basically a reservist army, but also uh, it is a settler army. Most of these people, when I was in, in Israel, I saw the big transformation of the Israeli army into becoming a settler army. From it used to be managed and led by the kibbutzniks, the people who lived in the kibbutzes. But then it changed, and the settlers took command over the main points of this army. So you're not going to be able to use the Israelis to remove them. Who's going to remove nearly a million Israelis um, from West Bank? I mean, there's no discussion that is serious about these things. It's right. just new, fabulous sort of ideas that people are using just to manage the problem, okay? We can't solve it, so 
we come up and we'll say Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states will do this and the other things. And they know that's not going to work. It's impossible to work. And so now we are faced with Israel going the full Sharon, as I call it, and trying to say the whole land of Israel is now disputed space. It is um, a fluid space. And we're going to operate militar militarily from the Litani right down to the Egypt and the Palestinians will be mobile, will be paralyzed within this uh, matrix that we're going to construct. And what is the answer from the West? It's, uh, they just come up with ever more fabulous ideas that somehow Saudi Arabia is going to resurrect the Palestinian Authority, which is going to persecute its own people. I mean, you know, wasn't that what they tried for 20 years in Afghanistan to get someone to preserve the government in Kabul, and then what happened? It collapsed in 11 days. They weren't going to go on killing their own Afghans. Here's uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's latest. I'm not sure if this was today or over the weekend, but it's uh, it's very, cut number six, Chris. Uh, it's very uh, fresh, and it's very Netanyahu. We continue the war on all fronts. We do not provide immunity to any terrorists, not in Gaza, not in Lebanon, not in Syria, and not anywhere else. Whoever tries to hurt us, we hurt him. Regarding our hostages, to date we have returned 110 of them back home, and we are committed to returning them all. This is one of the objectives of the war, and military pressure is a necessary condition for its completion. I work in this around on the clock. But to be clear, I reject outright the terms of surrender of the monsters of Hamas. In exchange for the release of our hostages, Hamas demands the end of the war, the withdrawal of our forces from Gaza, the release of all the murderers and rapists of the Nukba, and leaving Hamas intact. If we agree to this, our warriors fell in vain. If we agree to this, we will not be able to guarantee the security of our citizens. We will not be able to return the evacuees safely to their homes. And the next October 7th will only be a matter of time. October 7th will only be a matter of time. How do you read this? I think it's, uh, you know, I said to you earlier, and it's not been much publicized, but um, Saleh Arro, who was assassinated uh, in Beirut, was the hostage negotiator. He'd been in Doha just earlier. Um, they, the, the people in Doha, the, 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 the Hamas leaders there, are, are not the negotiators. The negotiators are in Gaza. The decision makers are in Gaza. And there is a complicated process of communication. And he was the, he was the link in it. So it's pretty clear uh, that Netanyahu is saying, because we're going to a, the big war now, the big war where we're going to take control of the entire security space of greater Israel, um, you know, the, the, the hostage issue is not, a, not an issue for us. And the rest of what he's saying is what I was really trying to sort of suggest is, you know, he's saying, if we accept Hamas's terms, if we accept, uh, you know, a, an all for all hostage exchange, which is what Hamas wants, i.e. six and a half thousand Palestinian hostages that are in prison to be released, and we accept the humiliation. I mean, this is how do you, how do you, how do you go on with the Zionist project? The Zionist project is then Appended is destroyed, and either they have to abandon it then, and then invent something else. But but there is no alternative for most Israelis, and I have to say, with this, he has the support of most Israelis. The latest polls show seventy five percent of Israelis wanted um, harsh measures in Gaza to continue, and were upset with the idea of them being sort of. Um, transformed into a modified, less uh, aggressive mode uh, to suit the American uh, demands. They wanted it to con wanted it to to continue and for Hamas to be excluded, and they want Gaza to be returned uh, to Israel. Essentially, they want it to, to be depopulated. Since last we um, 
spoke, there was quite a, uh, uh, a brouhaha in the Israeli war cabinet. Mm. And the former Israeli uh, military chief of staff, a retired uh, major general, went on Israeli television and made an argument more or less the opposite of what we just showed Prime Minister Netanyahu saying, we've already lost the war against Hamas. We can't defeat them. We can't get rid of them. There should be a ceasefire. We should negotiate and we should get our hostages uh, home. Uh, is BB still in domestic political trouble once the war is over? <laughs> once the war is over is the critical point of that, isn't it? Right. Who knows how that how long that will be? And he calculates that it's going on for a long time with, with, with the change. But I, I have to say, it would be very, very hard for most um, Israelis. And he is right on this, I think. I'm not taking a side or anything, but I'm just saying the facts as they are. The most Israelis would be horrified that if all Palestinian prisoners were released um, for the hostages in Gaza. They don't have that in mind. They would like a few people to be released, perhaps, like we saw earlier. But to release all, and that's the Hamas uh, demand, all for all. In other words, they're saying, we deny your whole security paradigm over greater Israel, a West Bank. And here, we're not prepared to accept it. And we are releasing these people, forcing you to release them as the first stage to liberate our territory from Zionism. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure it's, you know, he's uh, uh, he would be asking a lot for Israel to accept it because there's no alternative. Do you think Israel is in danger of imploding? Yes, because it's overreaching. It, this w which we've just described as sort of trying to put a military matrix across the whole of greater Israel includes Hezbollah. And it includes, of course, um, the West Bank, which is on a knife edge now. Um, so they are really overreaching and taking a big gamble. Now, I don't know uh, what the agreement is with, uh, with the, the Americans, with the White House, about the war against Hezbollah. But we're getting closer and closer. You will recall only yesterday, four more Hezbollah, Hezbollah leaders were assassinated. Um, by Israel, um, and we've seen the rise in tensions with Iran. Um, what is going to happen from that? Is America going to join in? Is it going to support it? Or is it going to leave it to Israel? I mean, he's taking it, and Israel is taking a huge gamble to save Zionism by taking on Hezbollah as well as Hamas, as well as the West Bank forces. So, I mean, it's a big gamble. Is the um, shelling of the Houthis by uh, the United States likely to widen, to expand the war? It already has, because the, the reaction to this was in Iraq, uh, when 20 ballistic missiles were fired on the big American base, uh, Ain, al, Ain al Assad base. Um, and there were many American, the, 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 the U.S. forces there have the latest, um, the Patriot missile defense system, and it didn't, it wasn't effective. Uh, I don't know the exact figures, but obviously many of these um, ballistic missiles reached the target. And there are heavy casualties. There is a lot of talk that there were four American deaths. I mm. can't confirm that. But there is a lot of speculation that there are American deaths this time in this attack. But 20 ballistic missiles, not just rockets or drones, um, were fired from Iraq, not from Iran, within Iraq um, at Ain al-Assad. Al and I'm, that clearly is not unconnected to what was happening in Yemen. Does uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu want to expand the war in order to draw the United States in? Yes, of course. I mean, this is the trap he set for the United States. And I keep, I've been saying, I think, on this program to you that I think that what he is trying to do is precisely that. I mean, he'd love it to even extend to Iran, but that's not going to happen, I think.
But clearly, if there is a conflict with in the North, he will want to see American not just legitimizing of his action, which is already given, but to see actual support, American support, because Hezbollah is a formidable um, opponent. It's not like Hamas. It has 150,000 missiles, sophisticated, new, trained, experienced forces on the ground. I mean, it'll be a very different and very much tougher war. But it seems that inevitably we're going that way, and inevitably America is going to get drawn in more deeply, not only in Yemen, but I know there's a lot of pressure on the White House now to really send a clear, hard message in Iraq to the to the forces there, and that will escalate it, and we will find the Americans drawn into more and more, if you like, um, uh, responses. Uh, against uh, attacks on American bases in Iraq and Syria. If there is a wider uh, war, will uh, the British be involved, or does that depend on who's the prime minister at the time the war widens? <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, it embarrasses me when you ask me about what the British policy will do. <laughs> I, so, I couldn't resist. <laughs> yeah, so I'd prefer... I mean, uh, they'll do whatever they're asked to do. Uh, that's the short and All long right. of it. They'll do do that. But, you know, they said when they joined on Yemen, and I thought it was a very foolish commitment to make. They said, oh, this is just going to be a one a, a one off strike on Yemen and the Houthis. And we don't have an, any intention of going to war against Yemen. Well, why did you fire all those missiles into it if you knew what they're like? I mean, it was very silly to if that was the basis of your decision. Alistair, my dear friend, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. I know you're traveling. I appreciate very much, as as do the folks watching us now and later, uh, the time and uh, analysis that you've given us. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Of course. Uh, top, absolutely uh, top of his game. Coming up later this morning, uh, Larry Johnson, uh, Ray McGovern this afternoon, Kyle Anzalone, and uh, the great professor John Mearsheimer. Judge Napolitano for judging freedom.